So what we're going to be sort of looking at today is the female Gothic um, and whether this is a useful term to use and if so, what it means and how it can be used, how it can be deployed in thinking about the Gothic. Um, so it's quite a popular term um, and it really dates back to sort of uh, second wave feminist work within sort of English literature or Anglophone literature. Um, and we can date it back, the term itself, very expressly to Ellen Moyers in her book, Literary Women. Um, one of the things we're going to think about today is the fact of this as a constructed term and a constructed sort of retroactively applied term um, that seeks to group together literature, which did not necessarily group itself together at the time. Um, I'm going to be problematizing some of our conceptions of the female Gothic. If you know me, you know I don't really love it as a term or as a way of engaging with the Gothic. But hopefully in the discussion, or if you're at home in your own thinking, there'll be the opportunity to sort of debate and decide what we think about this term and what we think about this idea of the female Gothic. I've put a picture in the background, which hopefully um, I wanted to use it to both exemplify some of our most common ideas of the female Gothic, but also already to sort of problematize them because we have this uh, image from the film Crimson Peak, which is obviously a sort of homage to the old Gothic romances, um, including the sort of the Radcliffean romance, uh, the stereotypically female Gothic, if you will. Um, but we also have a film that is uh, directed and written by men. So we're already getting that slight sort of problematization, I think, of this term, like how are we using it and how does it apply? So um, the first bit that I'm going to do, I've got uh, 10 books here. So some of them you might have read, some of them you might not have read, some of them you might know but not have read, that's all all right. If you have questions about any of them, um, you're very welcome to ask me for a plot point. But I want you to decide of these 10 books, which in your opinion, are the female Gothic and why? How are you defining or understanding the female Gothic when you apply that term? Okay, so I'm going to stop recording briefly. There we go. So um, many of these stories um, attach to some kind of definition of the female Gothic, but the definition of the female Gothic that we're using tends to change in relation to each book. So um, we might think about the fact that they're written by women, but obviously A Bride for Bedivere is written by a man uh, using a female pseudonym or an ambiguous pseudonym. Um, we might think about particular plots that apply to something like The Mistress of Udolpho or even The Mistress of Mellon to make her a, a woman in peril. But those certainly don't apply to novels like Wuthering Heights in the same way or Beloved or The Wide Sargasso Sea. Often our conceptions of the female Gothic are limited um, to a fairly narrow conception of what women's experience is. And often in our discussions or use throwing around of the term female Gothic, we marginalize stories but like those by Toni Morrison or even things like the Wide Sargasso Sea, which include conceptions um, and interrogations of race. Or look at the specific position of oppression suffered by black women um, in, the, in the case of Beloved. Um, we also sort of have ideas that these are focused on women's stories, but then you look at a text like The Old English Baron by Clara Reeve from the 1780s, very key text to the development of the Gothic. Uh, it has no major female characters at all, and Mary Shelley's work is almost entirely bereft of important female characters um, in her major novels. So while we might think of quite a lot of these as somehow adjacent with the female Gothic, how we're understanding and defining the female Gothic begins to get a little bit blurry. So let's have a look at a couple of definitions and understandings that have been prominent in trying to define and use the term female Gothic. Well, the term originated with Ellen Moyers in Literary Women and she says, what I mean by female Gothic is easily defined. The work of women, the work that women writers have done in the literary mode that since the 18th century, we have called the Gothic. And that does seem like a nice, easy little package of a <laughs> definition. But as we've already noted, there's a problem with this. There's actually a couple of problems with this. Um, it sort of suggests that you can form a really easy distinction um, of between work written by women and written by men and written by people who don't fit within that gender binary as well. 
although obviously this kind of usage of female and male gothic doesn't leave any room for people outside the gender binary quite often. Um, but as I've already mentioned, one of the major problems is that um, if we try to use this term of, well, the female gothic is written by women, we have to confront the fact that many of the books that fit into other definitions of the female gothic or genres that are generally associated with the female gothic, like the 20th century gothic romance, are often written by men using female pseudonyms. All of these writers, quite famous, uh, Hilary Ford, Diana Dyer, that that's the uh, pen name of Dean Koontz, Susan Claudia, Madeline Brent, Caroline Farr, all of these uh, are the pseudonyms of male writers. So if these novels were in keeping with the wider gothic genre of the gothic romance, repeating many of the same tropes, plots and concerns, how are we differentiating then? How are we saying that the female gothic is somehow different? Or in, is a, an easily defined separate field. Um, I have an example from the 18th century here as well of how books openly written by both men and women um, could be incredibly similar, both in terms of their plot, the tropes they use, and in terms of their concerns. And so again, the question becomes, well, how can we really define this sort of difference between male and female Gothic? And why would we suggest um, very particularly that everybody who writes a story that follows some of these beats is writing in a female genre or is writing a female book and vice versa um, that people writing in the horror gothic are writing a male book so uh, just these two texts i've compared them Anne radcliffe's the romance of the forest and tj horsley curtis's ethelwina or the house of fitzalban um, both of them sort of feature uh, as the main character a heroine in peril whose inheritance is threatened by usurpation um, in both cases, a villain kidnaps the, the heroine. In, in Anne Radcliffe's Romance of the Forest, it's her uncle, and in T.J. Hosley Curtis's Ethelwina, it is her cousin. And the threat to the heroine is sexual, economic, and potentially mortal. So the same threat in both, the same concerns are being navigated. Um, in both, the hero, weirdly enough, is unable to rescue the heroine, relatively useless. The story ends in a companionate marriage, and the hero is very clearly uh, sort of investigated as not threatening to the heroine. In Romance in the Gothic, um, he is somebody who uh, fails to be able to rescue her with slightly sort of lower or equal social status. Um, it's actually servants that end up helping her the most. Um, and in T.J. Horsley Curtis's Ethelwina, it's a sort of adopted sibling almost who ends up being the love interest. Um, this sibling is of a lower social status than her. Um, in Romance of the Forest, the heroine acts as the avenger of her father's murder. That's her purpose. And it's exactly the same in Ethelwina. The one real difference that I could find between them is that in the Romance of the Forest, the heroine is shown to be a sublime subject. What do I mean by a sublime subject? Well, she's shown to not be, if you're looking at that um, Edmund Burke differentiation between the sublime and the beautiful in the 18th century, which is very, very gendered. Men are sublime, women are beautiful. Women are objects of the gaze. Men are creators of everything, of poetry, of art, of music. Well, in uh, Radcliffe's works, there's often an emphasis on the heroine as sublime subject, as creator as a uh, painter, singer, poet, um, with original genius. And that's the case in Romance of the Forest. In T.J. Horsley Curtis's, there's something sort of slightly more akin to our modern conceptions of what a heroine might, uh, might be doing, uh, that she is shown to be an effective leader and holds effectively positions of power because she's in charge of a large estate and she is venerated as such because of her good management. So, you can see here to call one of these female gothic and the other one a completely different genre is a sort of strange act, I would say. Um, and it also uh, brings up some interesting questions about even the content and how we attach the content to um, a particular idea of a gendered, a gendered genre. Um, so another um, definition, that people use or people have investigated is that of the female protagonist. 
So perhaps the most useful and uncontroversial ha, <laughs> definition of the classification is the classification will be limited to its narrative focus, namely on a female as opposed to a male protagonist. No problems, right? Easy. This is a book about women. Um, therefore, it's female gothic. Easy peasy. We get rid of the author question that way. Um, how do we then interact with texts like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? Um, which is in Ellen Moyer's Literary Women, it's her key example of a female Gothic. Now she reads it as a birth myth, she reads it through Mary Shelley's uh, biography, which um, you may agree with or question as a practice, but there's no denying that Mary Shelley is a female writer, perhaps encoding her own certainly concerns within the text. So to what extent can this be rejected as an, uh, as an example of the female Gothic and why? Um, similarly, you have uh, texts like The Doom of the Griffiths by Elizabeth Gaskill, another female writer, um, which focuses on a male protagonist. The Quiet Gentleman by Georgette Heyer, similarly, a Gothic romance, which is focalized through the male protagonist. Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice. Well, look at that, it's focused on a male protagonist. So does the inclusion of a male protagonist mean that this is not female gothic somehow? Does it mean that the same themes and concerns can't be running through the text? Does it mean that this is somehow a less female book? And what then does this term female mean? Um, the sort of the last one in this little set of definitions that I'm looking at is the idea that we can link the female Gothic to this conception of the female reader. So there are numerous critics like E.J. Cleary and Anne Williams that point to the idea of the female Gothic as a form written by and for women. So there are certain variations of the genre of the Gothic that are written for and by women, like the Gothic romance in the 20th century and like the Radcliffean Gothic in the 18th. But uh, as we know, men uh, read, I don't know why I said forms, but well, they read forms of the Gothic to which the label female Gothic is often applied. So can we really define it by who's reading it? That seems a strange practice. It seems a problematic practice um, because both men and women are reading all of the books that we've mentioned so far. And how are we to identify the implied reader in the text? Um, one of the ways that you might in the 18th century is by looking at the moral. Uh, texts which focus on the female protagonist tend to focus on a reward for virtue and on a male protagonist on punishment for crimes. But then that breaks down when we look at books like The Floyer um, and the uh, punishment for crimes is enacted against a woman. But how are we meant to identify the implied reader? The moral talks to the reader, but it's not always easy to discern to whom it's talking, even in that most direct of addresses. So how can we use the female reader as a definition if we don't know who the implied reader necessarily is? We also have plenty of documentary evidence for men reading all forms of the early Gothic. And, and I think a sort of really good and interesting source for this is the discussions in Northanger Abbey. Um, then there's a differentiation made there's the discussion with Mr. Thorpe, who's the sort of awful character, where, you know, Catherine's going, oh, have you ever read Udolfo, Mr. Thorpe? And he's like, oh, God, no. Ugh, I don't read that girly trash. Um, you know, I don't read anything but Tom Jones and the Monk, i.e. the sexy books. Um, and she goes, oh, I think you'd like Udolfo, you know. And he's like, oh, well, I don't read any womenly books except Mrs. Radcliffe's books. And she's like, oh, it, it is Mrs. Radcliffe, though. But if you just read this, you might think, yeah, there is a distinction between male and female readers and the types of Gothic that they're reading and enjoying. But that's him, by the way, in the, uh, the my preferred version of Northanger Abbey. <laughs> but then you have the discussion with Henry Tilney and a different perspective comes through. The person, be it gentleman or lady, who has not pleasure in a good novel must be intolerably stupid. I have read all Mrs. Radcliffe's works and most of them with great pleasure. The Mysteries of Udolpho, when I had once begun it, I could not lay down again. I remember finishing it in two days, my hair standing on end the whole time. So here it becomes somewhat more clear that 
the sort of choice between Mysteries of Udolpho and the Monk isn't based on gender per se, so much as it's based on taste. Um, and obviously this is um, a novel being written by a female author, but I think it offers a uh, fairly good um, sort of uh, evidence of prevailing cultural discussions at the time. Um, you can also remember with Northanger Abbey that the list which um, Catherine is given by Isabella of horrid novels doesn't differentiate in any way between what we would think of as the male and female gothic or the terror and the horror gothic or however we're wanting to create these kind of binaries. Um, instead, it's a complete mix of different types of the gothic, borrowing from the German and from the English, with and without the supernatural, with and without extreme scenes of horror. So we have evidence as well of women reading all types of gothic to suggest that sort of there was one type of gothic for women and another type for men doesn't really follow uh, the evidence, if you will. So. Um, the next bit goes into a little bit more of the things that we were talking about in our discussion, these ideas of the themes, perhaps, um, and the sort of the actual characteristics of the book. Um, now, this is uh, in some of the definitions. People talk about the difference, uh, different aesthetics and forms between male and female Gothic. So this is how some people uh, sort of work through their definition. Now, it's worth noting that these are really being applied to that 18th century Gothic. And as soon as we put them in a 20th century context, they really fall apart. I think that uh, The Woman in Black by Susan Hill is always a really good one to hold up because it's very clearly Gothic. It's very clearly by a woman. It's very clearly about women um, in some form and addresses female concerns, but it doesn't really adhere to any of these considerations of aesthetic and form. Um, because uh, there is this idea that the, the male Gothic is linked to horror and the female Gothic to terror in this sort of Radcliffean division, which many of you I think will be familiar with, um, that the terror is that which causes sort of, which uses obscurity and uncertainty to cause that sort of terror that then expands the mind, expands the mind into curiosity and wonder where you're like, what's that noise? It could be a ghost, a ghoul, a goblet, a mum in the cellar. Whereas horror freezes our faculties and the blood in our veins because we're confronted with a corpse. There's nothing to wonder about. There's just grotesque horror. Um, and so there's this idea of that division within the texts. There's also, as we talked about, this conception that the male Gothic has a real supernatural in it and the female Gothic does not. Um, there's also, um, in some, an emphasis on the male gothic as being more visually oriented and the female gothic is more audially orient oriented. So female gothic is all about un and heard noises and the visual gothic all about confronted with terrifying sights. Um, and then in terms of the form, uh, the, the sort of discussion of, well, the point of view will be limited in some way. Um, within the male gothic, it will usually be limited to a male perspective and then the female gothic to a female perspective. But to what extent, can this be said to be true? To what extent do these divisions even work? Well, I think we can already see that there are examples of books by women that don't adhere to this. The Floyer is very clearly more in the horror gothic tradition uh, with a real devil appearing, as is the woman in, what, in black in the, in the current century. Um, but there's a problem even with that attempt to distinguish and to create a really clear boundary between the terror and the horror gothic, between these different aesthetic forms. So Edward Jacobs, in what is a really good essay, Radcliffe Genericism and Gender in Anne Radcliffe Romanticism and the Gothic, says that scholarship on the genericism of the gothic has tended to emphasize that difference between female terror and male horror. In many ways, reproducing as fact the distinction polemically drawn by Radcliffe herself in On the Supernatural in Poetry, which I've put as reading for the 18th century class on Wednesday. Yet, this scholarly emphasis arguably distorts historical practice, since Lewis and most horror gothic writers themselves in fact reproduce the terror gothic conventions that Radcliffe's novels popularised, and hence less authored a rival gothic genre than added elements of graphic horror and or supernatural events to the conventions that Radcliffe herself popularised. In other words, this, these techniques of the terror gothic, this obscurity and uncertainty, form as key a part in the horror gothic as they do in the so-called so terror gothic. So to what extent can we even create this aesthetic binary? 
the next one, we talked about this a little bit in our discussion as well. Um, quite a lot of the definitions that you'll find, some of the most famous ones, by, for example, Anne Williams in The Art of Darkness and Joanna Russ in, in Somebody's Trying to Kill Me and I Think It's My Husband. Um, they tend to go for plot-based definitions of the female Gothic. And this is Anne Williams' version where she has a heroine, a home of initiation, a happily ever after, a responsibility, a suitor, a second suitor, a male antagonist, a female antagonist, and a confidant. And those last three, um, there can be differences as with the second suitor. It might, there might not be a second suitor. But there's this very clear in her mind uh, sequence of events, very tropey, going from one to the other, this very clear, linear, cookie cutter kind of plot. Um, in a sort of very similar theoretical move, Joanna Russ does the same with the Gothic romance of the 20th century. Uh, she bases it on a sort of Jane Eyre narrative. So you've got an inexperienced heroine, a large brooding house, an exotic or wild country. Um, an absent or deceased or wicked mother, an absent or dead father, a super male, another woman who's a threat, a rival or a double, um, a buried secret or two or three or four, a young girl, uh, usually, you know, the sort of Adele figure who needs looking after by the heroine who shows, um, you know, the hero how to love. Um, then a possible shadow male who looks like he's a good one, but he's not a dog. Um, so if you've read Quiet Gentleman, that's Theo as a shadow male. Um, and then ominous dialogue, obviously, <laughs> much. Don't go into the turret on Wednesdays, that sort of thing. And then the inevitable untangling. So we have these, these plots that they're saying, this is what the Gothic romance is. This is what the female Gothic is. I don't like it. I very much don't like it. Because what uh, we get is, in my opinion, the description to prescription pipeline going on. So what happens when these uh, definitions are being written is that they pick out frequent features of the genre and then that becomes over time the definition of requisite features of the genre. So it becomes, it moves from observation and description of common tropes to saying this is what the genre is, this is what it always is, this is what it needs to be um, a book in this genre. But many of the books that we have um, don't conform to this. If you read Laurier Page's The Gothic Romance Wave, and she did a talk for us as well, she talks about the ways in which the Gothic romance fundamentally changed from its inception or from its rise in popularity in the 1960s. But we can already see by looking at a couple of examples how these definitions don't work for many books. In The Trembling Hills by Phyllis Whitney, it's one of my, it's one of my favorite, has one of my favorite lines of all time because there's this really weird kid character in it who decides to describe everyone by comparing them to a type of food. And the type of food to which she compares the hero is white bread. I don't think it could be any more obvious. There's nothing of the dark, mysterious, uh, threatening suitor there. There's no uh, real shadow male. There's a, there's a young man who's a bit of a playboy, but there's nothing sinister about him. He's just not the right man for her. And really the, the story focuses on the relationship of the protagonist with numerous female figures and their machinations and includes friendships with women of her own age and uh, sort of what happens to her friend and why it happens is more of a mystery and more of a cause of tension than anything that's happening between her and the hero. She's also the one with the money and power, not him. So you can see how this, by, this novel by a writer, Phyllis A. Whitney, who is one of the sort of key and most famous writers of Gothic romances, just doesn't really fit that formula at all. If we're looking at the 18th century formula, a novel like Charlotte Dacker's The Floyer or the Moor, very clearly based on a female character, um, interacts with female experience. Um, but this is a story of a woman who murders her way through everybody who gets between her and what she wants. It's not the story of a heroine weebling around in a castle waiting to be rescued. In fact, she does play that role at one point, but that's exactly the point. She plays that role in order to get what she wants from somebody else. Um, the Bride of Pandoric, I think, is another example, which um, is, it demonstrates what I would like to call the distorting effect of these kind of plot definitions because a lot of those features of the plot apply to Bride of Pandoric, 
Um, she is entering a new place. There is a mystery in the house. There's something weird about her husband, although he's a smiling, laughing guy, so not quite a dark brooding master, but there is some secret going on. But what this definition erases, and this is very true of pretty much all the Victoria Holt novels, I would say, is that one of the major features of Victoria Holt novels is that there are a lot of female characters in interrelation with each other. So in this story, there's various friends, various relatives, and it turns out the sort of baddies are a, a couple of grandmas, except one of them's dead, but not the one you think is dead, and there's doubles. But if we use that definition of the Gothic romance, which focuses on that relationship between the male and female protagonist, we actually miss most of what the novel is doing. So onto the one that I'm most in agreement with, but yet still have problems with. So we'll see what you think of this, because this was the one that I felt like most people were leaning towards. The idea that the female Gothic can be defined by its depiction of or interaction with female experience and subtext. And the really sort of key text, obviously, for this idea is Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar's The Mad Woman in the Attic. So their argument about Victorian fiction more generally is that more specifically, however, the one plot that seems to be one plot, guys, all that women write can be boiled down to one plot um, that seems to be concealed in most of the 19th century literature by women, which will concern us here, is in some sense a story of the woman writer's quest for her own story. It is a story, in other words, of the woman's quest for self-definition. So the attempt to write oneself, to write one's own experience into the text. Um, I've used the illustration uh, of Bertha ripping the veil from uh, Jane Eyre because um, one of the books that they talk about in great detail, obviously from the title Mad Woman in the Attic, is this idea of Bertha Mason. And they view Bertha as sort of the dark double, um, basically the, the human manifestation of Jane's anger. Um, so this is the idea. So let's have a look at kind of what is this female experience that is being included in the text according to some critics. So Gilbert and Gubar, back to them, uh, note that um, the female Gothic is narrating patriarchal oppression. So there's dramatizations of imprisonment and escape that are so all pervasive in 19th century literature by women that we believe they represent a uniquely female tradition in this period. So this idea that all of those narratives of running through hidden corridors, getting locked away in cellars, etc., are manifestations of sort of the position of women, um, their uh, confinement and the claustrophobic sort of experience of being a woman in the period. Although, of course, which women are they talking about? We'll get back to that in a second, because it does create one narrative of being a woman. Um, if we're thinking about like, this, this is the narrative of being a woman, right? Being imprisoned and wishing to escape. That is what it is to be a woman in the 19th century along very particular lines is what they seem to be suggesting in this kind of reading of the Gothic. Um, Davidson argues, Davidson, sorry, argues that uh, the female Gothic has gender inflected social commentary. So the female Gothic spoke back to the mainstream Gothic form, a specific gender aware perspective. So she uses the example uh, of sort of, you know, the difference between Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto um, and its heroine in distress, and then something like Anne Radcliffe's uh, rewriting of the genre, which focuses much more on Emily as subject and on her sort of economic positioning, etc. cetera. Um, it doesn't, of course, uh, reflect on the ways in which books by women and men reflected similar realities, or investigated them, or the way in which women could be writing about, um, as for example, Clara Reeve, who spoke back to Walpole very directly, she addressed him in her preface, um, would focus on a, on a male story. So it's not quite engaging with the fact that this isn't what always happened, but we can think of that as a possibility. Uh, Davison also claims that it, it reflects on women's experience of love, domesticity, marriage, and property, property ownership, that that's the key to the Gothic. Um, so she talks about Radcliffe's novels established an enduring female Gothic recipe, oh, I don't like that word, that explored the conjunction between love and terror, called women's domestic roles and ideals into question and contested property related issues. Despite several recent claims about her tame and conservative standpoint, Radcliffe dared to imagine a Wollstonecraftian world where women retained control over their own financial affairs. I mean, she did and she didn't. If you look at um, The Mysteries of Edolfo, 
um, sort of all of the adventures take centre stage, but a lot of it's actually about Emily's economic position and her inheritance and how that is being manipulated away from her by various different male and female figures. Um, and in the end, she gains control of her own inheritance, but she then gives it up to Valancourt when she marries him. So it is uh, sort of interested in the economic state of women, but I think to call it a Wollstonecraftian world is going a step too far, personally. Um, but is this sort of the essence of the Gothic? Of course, it's quite a limited woman's world that's allowed to appear, but perhaps, what do we think? Um, E.J. Clary notes uh, quite strongly that this, this idea of um, that we just looked at is very limited, actually, and that often female Gothic descriptions, plots, etc., do tend to limit female experience in how they describe the genre. So she looks at Zafloya um, and she says, well, what happens if we lay aside our assumptions about women's writing and look at women's Gothic? So instead of coming to it with a definition and the idea of what the concerns will be, what do we find? Well, we find there suggests the need for another story, wild passions, the sublime, supernatural phenomena, violent conflict, murder and torture, sexual excess and perversion, outlandish settings, strange minglings of history and fantasy. So E.G. Clary kind of pushes outwards a little bit to include different forms of female experience, but I think it's still limited. So one of my so my stance on this, and we can debate this um, now, is that if we use this idea of female experience and subtext as the female gothic, some problems can occur and often do occur in our definitions. First of all, one of the reasons I'm not a fan of the Gilbert and Gubar definition is this idea that women only and always are writing about female experience. I think we see this happening with um, Ellen Moyer's reading of Frankenstein as a birth myth through Mary Shelley's autobiography as well, biography, sorry, in that it reduces everything else that Mary Shelley is doing. It reduces everything else that's going on, the wider social commentary on things like class or race or on philosophy, science, theology. It reduces them to a question of female experience. It also, in our definitions, tends to universalize women's experience. And we have to think about, well, what women's experience are we talking about? I think I sent to you um, a short story by Sarah Wilkinson, The Count of Montabino, um, which is a quite good example, I think, in one story of the way in which, subconsciously at least, our model of what the female Gothic is leans towards a white middle class cis hetero woman. Because in that story, written by Sarah Wilkinson, it's a chat book written by somebody from a lower social status than many of our Gothic authors. You have the story of the typical kind of Gothic heroine who escapes from the castle and the persecution of their uncle. Then you have a secondary story of a woman who comes from a lower social status, who's found sort of almost dead with only one of her children still living, the other two have died in the tower of the castle. And you learn that her story is one of seduction and ill usage by the same man. But her story and the story of the first two heroines divert considerably because of their social class. Um, and I think it's quite a good example of the way in which there are very different stories that women were having based on other factors of the time. And often our definitions of the female Gothic don't actually explore or accept or acknowledge that. Like when we talked about Toni Morrison's Beloved, it's often not one of the first books that people come to as female Gothic, but why not? Um, when it's written by a woman about a woman exploring female experience. Um, the other sort of problem for me with female Gothic now, as we're using it today, in its inception, in second wave feminism, it was an attempt to draw out, recognize, acknowledge the work that women have done and were doing in the Gothic. But what tends to happen now is if we create ideas of a male and a female tradition, we create them as somehow separate, not recognizing the way in which they're part of a unified Gothic tradition, potentially, but also tying back into hierarchies of value. And we have the Gothic and the female Gothic. We have, oh, well, the Gothic and then that women's Gothic. If we, if we tie uh, sort of 
a particular, you know, if we have this kind of idea of a gender genre, um, it does tend to then get tied back into hierarchies of value. And nowhere is this clearer than if you look at the Gothic romance of the 20th century, which receives almost no critical attention and is still relatively despised within the academy compared to a male horror, um, which is, uh, you know, I think sort of an example of how this tying of a genre to gender can just reestablish these hierarchies of value. Um, and then, you know, the question that keeps sort of haunting me is, well, how can we differentiate between a female Gothic and an almost identical novel written by a man or a non-binary individual, for example? How can we meaningfully differentiate? Um, and if we can't, what does that do to our definition of the female Gothic? So um, I'm going to stop talking. And I'm going to leave us with some questions to ponder that if you want to stay, we can discuss these questions. If you have to go, then do feel free. Um, but the questions to ponder are these. Do you think that the female Gothic is still a relevant term? Do you believe in this idea of separate terror and horror schools? Is that a good replacement framework or does it fall into the same problems? Is a female Gothic work necessarily feminist? And does the term female Gothic tend towards the dismissal of female Gothic texts? So let's discuss these questions and thank you for coming to the class.